please join me in welcoming Anna O'Marley, lovely scholar. Also, silence your cell phones too. Thank you. Okay, I should have told Abby to shorten that one a little bit, but thank you. It makes me feel good. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to uh, answer two questions. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to our amazing speakers. Uh, the first question is, why Schuylkill to Hudson? And the second is, why our speakers? So um, then I will introduce both of them, and they will each talk for 20 minutes. Then we will sit uh, here, and I will ask them some probing questions. And then we will open it up to you to ask probing questions. So why Schuylkill to Hudson? Um, I have been really interested in landscape representation since I was an undergrad at Vassar College on the Hudson. And I've, for many years, thought about what came before the Hudson River School. And so when I started at PAFA 10 years ago, I, I started researching landscape painting in Philadelphia, and I came to realize that um, there has never been an exhibition on landscape painting in Philadelphia, and that Philadelphia had a really important role in creating a national school of landscape. So um, that brings me to our speakers today. Um, and uh, we did a great learning to look tour upstairs uh, earlier um, where we looked in detail at some paintings uh, in the show. And what I've asked our speakers to do today is to take a broader view. And so uh, I like to think of, of Frank and Laura as being on different poles of a really spectacular spectrum of scholars. Um, Frank taught me how to look at paintings 17 years ago when I was his intern at the National Gallery of Art. And uh, so it is an unbelievable honor for him, for me, that he came up here from DC, where he is the deputy director and chief curator of the National Gallery of Art, to uh, talk with us today. Um, I'm also thrilled that my former curatorial intern, Rami Mize, is here. Um, and I hope uh, in 17 years, um, she will invite me to whatever fabulous museum she is working at um, to think about my career. And Rami will be signing books with me upstairs afterwards because she also wrote an essay for the catalog. Um, but I, I think there's a continuity there. So Frank taught me how to look at paintings. And then Laura has taught me how to relook at paintings. Um, so um, what um, I will... So I think what I'll do now is I'll give you their introductions, and you'll see their different areas of specialization and why I brought them here today to give the talks that they're going to give to us about the Schuylkill and the Hudson. So Laura Turner Igo is the brand new curator of American art at the James Michener Art Museum in Doylestown. She specializes in American art and material culture of the long 19th century and is really um, uh, engaged with environmental conditions and change over that period. She received her PhD from Temple, and she's been supported in her scholarship by the NEH, the Henry Luce Foundation, and the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I highly recommend the book that she co-edited, A Green Country Town, Philadelphia's Ecology and the Cultural Imagination. And also, you may have seen an exhibition that she contributed to recently, Nature's Nation, American Art and the Environment, that was at Princeton. At the Michener, she's the curator of the current exhibition, which I think just opened this week, and she's still here today, um, Impressionism to Modernism, the Lenfest Collection of American Art. Um, and she's working on a show for next spring called Rising Tides, Contemporary Art and the Ecology of Water. And she has promised me that she is going to do a revelatory exhibition on um, uh, Pennsylvania Impressionism, which is so, so needed. So I'm waiting for that one. Uh, so Laura will go first. Then our second pa panelist is Frank Kelly who is an art historian who specializes in 18th, 19th, and early 20th century American and British paintings. As I mentioned, he's deputy director and chief curator at the National Gallery of Art, and he also teaches in the Department of Art History at the University of Maryland College Park. His publications include Frederick Edwin Church and the National Landscape, Frederick Edwin Church, Thomas Cole's Paintings of Eden, 
He was the co-curator in 1995 of the Winslow Homer exhibition. He was the curator also of 20th Century American Art, the Ebsworth Collection, which was uh, at the National Gallery and the Seattle Art Museum in 2000. And he was the co-organizer of the exhibition Hudson River School Visions, the Landscapes of Sanford Gifford, Gifford, which was held at the Met, the Eamon Carter, and the National Gallery. And he was working on that when I was his intern. So that had a really profound effect on me. In 2005, he organized the exhibition Constable's Great Landscapes, which he co-organized and was shown at the Tate Britain, the National Gallery, the Huntington Art Gallery, and the Huntington Art Gallery. Two exhibitions he helped organize were also Edward Hopper and J.M.W. Turner, which was shown uh, at the National Gallery in 2007 and 2008. So um, I'm really honored that both of them will be talking us to, to us today about the Schuylkill and the Hudson and about how our perceptions of uh, scholarship of American landscape has changed in the past 40 years. So let's give a warm welcome to our first speaker, Dr. Laura Turner Igo. Thank you, Anna, for that really kind introduction and what a fabulous exhibition, too, and I'm sure you all have seen it, um, but go see it again after this. Yeah. So one painting on display in From the Schuylkill to the Hudson exhibition appears at first glance as an outlier. Art historians would classify it as a genre scene, not a landscape, and it does not visually depict either of the rivers, Schuylkill or Hudson, referenced in the exhibition's title. Fourth of July in Center Square by the artist John Lewis Crimmel instead features a diverse crowd congregated in Center Square, Philadelphia, to celebrate the anniversary of the nation's independence. Figures extend across the middle and foreground, collected together in small gatherings representing different social and racial groups. In the background, the engine house of the Philadelphia Waterworks, designed by the architect Benjamin Henry Latrobe, emits a plume of smoke from its steam engines hidden behind its classical facade. Scholars have previously interpreted this painting as a celebration of harmony and concord, presided over by the engine house, a successful marriage of art and industry. A consideration of the intimate entanglement of this represented site with the Schuylkill River and other environmental forces, however, offers a new interpretation of this work as a satirical critique of corruption and unequal and inefficient distribution of resources at a moment of heightened anxiety about environmental conditions, pollution, and public health in early national Philadelphia. We have increasingly become accustomed to contemporary artists confronting climate change and ecological crisis in their art. This, in fact, will be the subject of the Michener Art Museum's Spring 2020 exhibition, which Anna just mentioned, entitled Rising Tides, Contemporary Art and the Ecology of Water. Celebrating the 50th anniversary of Earth Day next year, uh, Rising Tides will feature work by contemporary artists from the Bucks County and greater Philadelphia region that are investigating the effects of global warming, climate change, and related environmental concerns on bodies of water and aquatic species. And actually, there's work by Diane Burko that's uh, displayed upstairs as well. And I think Margarita Hagen has displayed work here at PAFA before and, and I think is planning to um, next year as well. So there is a growing movement in art history, however, to investigate the instrumental role that environmental conditions and ecological change played in shaping and resisting artistic production and development in historical periods as well. Termed eco-criticism, this approach recovers lost or neglected evidence of environmental conditions that bear on politics, society, and culture recognizing the agency of non-human environmental factors with which artworks engage. I feel like I'm not pointing this at the right thing. <laughs> Examining the Center Square Waterworks in Krimmel's painting through an eco-critical lens illuminates a wider set of historical concerns arising from ecological change. Although Krimmel and Latrobe, the waterworks architect, lived in an era before the term ecology even existed, they grappled with the dynamic interrelationships and transformations in nature for which that term would eventually be coined. The Center Square Waterworks, depicted on the left here by Thomas and William Russell Birch, were initially conceived to improve the health of Philadelphia residents in an effort to decrease the risk of yellow fever, disastrous outbreaks of which in the late 18th century mobilized citizens to improve the sanitary conditions of the city. 
Philadelphians previously obtained their water from wells and cisterns, easily polluted by filth draining from the streets, nearby cesspools, and outhouses. In 1798, the city commissioned Latrobe, who's best known today for his designs for the US Capitol in DC, to design a water system that would bring clean water to city inhabitants. In Latrobe's design, uh, steam engines, a relatively new technology in late 18th century America, pumped water from the Schuylkill River to a reservoir at the top of the engine house at, engines at Center Square. And from this elevated reservoir, water was distributed to, small, by, uh, to smaller wooden pipes for supplying free public hydrants, fountains, uh, and commercial and residential subscribers in the eastern part of the city. Latrobe selected the Schuylkill as a water source because he argued it was cleaner and less susceptible to the dramatic tidal changes that affected the more developed Delaware River. The Schuylkill depicted here um, on the left by Charles Wilson Peel and on the right by Latrobe had a historic association with good health, having long been a refuge for wealthy Philadelphians who escaped to their country homes along the river's banks during yellow fever outbreaks. To house the engine house's elevated reservoir and steam engine at Center Square, Latrobe envisioned a circular drum on a square foundation, appropriating temple and human, excuse me, appropriating temple and funerary forms from antiquity and echoing the neoclassical designs of the Schuylkill River estates. The birch's engraving of this temple to civic engineering on the left, printed a year prior to the structure's completion, visualized a symbol of economic prosperity, scientific achievement, and refined taste for the expanding city. So Latrobe, and, and many people don't even know this, but he also closely studied the natural world. And his extant writings, sketchings, and watercolors demonstrate that a deep knowledge of biological processes, hydrology, and interrelated systems framed his architectural designs. The architect's interest in natural history is readily apparent in the many watercolors he added to his sketchbooks between 1795 and 1820. Multiple drawings of dolphin fish, for example, on the right, uh, encountered during Latrobe's journey across the Atlantic Ocean from England to Virginia in 1796, highlight the species' aerodynamic um, shape and its colorful scales. And in the watercolor that I'm showing you on the left uh, of a dirt or mud dauber, which is a type of wasp that Latrobe described as architectonic, uh, he played close attention to the parallel tube-like cells constructed to incubate the wasp's eggs. For Latrobe, drawing provided a means to comprehend the natural world, increase the appreciation of its beauty, and draw connections between related processes. A series of highly detailed watercolors of, watercolors of rattlesnake anatomy attributed to Latrobe demonstrate a heightened interest in internal structure, function, and circulatory processes that the architect manifested in his architectural and engineering drawings. Indeed, Latrobe's knowledge, is, knowledge of these processes maybe have even shaped his designs of buildings and water management devices. Latrobe's rattlesnake and waterworks drawings both emphasize the progression of matter, whether blood, nutrients, or water through a structure, further obscuring the boundaries between biological and architectural networks. And I would argue there's some compelling similarities between this drawing of a rattlesnake stomach and uh, a section of the waterworks from the Schuylkill River to the lower engine house. A lot of that is because um, Latrobe cho chose these almost like flesh color tones for a lot of his architectural drawings, giving them these sort of bodily um, associations. Um, but both drawings, I would say, are interested in the movement of matter through these, you know, veins or pipes um, through uh, space. So Latrobe's rattlesnake drawings and his waterworks designs therefore expose previously hidden elements and functions such as blood vessels, muscles, pipes, and supports, permitting the architect and the watercolors viewers to, and watercolors viewers to track, apprehend, and construct their interior processes. These drawings attest that Latrobe saw the natural world as dynamic, and he understood that environmental change impacted public health. For him, the waterworks functioned as a circulatory network, watering and cleansing a diseased city. And this is just a detail of those two drawings, which are really just beautiful to look at in general. By the time Crimmel produced and exhibited Fourth of July in Center Square, 11 years after the waterworks began operation, urban entertainments, crime, corruption, and fears of internal blockage became progressively associated with the site. 
Latrobe tightly crammed machinery within the engine house's dome cylinder, and once installed and operational, the volatile steam engines and their related machinery required frequent and expensive repairs and generally wreaked havoc on the waterworks system. Two workmen died from suffocation when working in the cramped space of the boiler chamber in 1801, and the system proved unreliable in crisis situations, failing to supply enough water to quench an 1805 fire because a manager siphoned excess steam power to run his own manufacturing business. During the first 25 years of its operation, Philadelphia's water system consumed approximately half of the city's budget, receiving even more money than fortifications erected during the War of 1812. The specifications of Latrobe's underground main and pipe system meant that the watering committee retained control over those who received water. Residents and businesses had to lobby the committee to have a main installed, pay a fee of up to $100 for a permit, which is a lot of money back then, and hire a committee appointed plumber to install the appropriate hookup. And I, I made a joke earlier in our gallery talk that this is not that different than how Philadelphia functions today. <laughs> While ostensibly introduced to benefit public health, the waterworks ultimately perpetuated environmental and social injustice by only delivering Schuylkill water directly to the homes of wealthy Philadelphia citizens. Residents of poor neighborhoods could only access the system via a public spigot. Although underground pipes connected homes and individuals to the body of the city and the Schuylkill River, they still excluded certain less affluent members of the urban population. I'm struggling here with this clicker. The clarity and composure that characterize the exterior of Latrobe's design, projecting an outward vision of health and classical virtue, therefore ultimately masked internal chaos and congestion. Crimmel's painting and other visual and other visual and textual responses to the site, however, suggest that the building's internal corruption still manifested itself externally within the urban landscape in various ways. Crimmel's depiction of the structure is far removed from the gleaming white vision initially depicted by Thomas and William Russell Birch in the city of Philadelphia, a popular illustrated text published in 1800. The facade of the engine house in Crimmel's painting appears, model, appears modeled and discolored, and two windows, actually, which you can only see if you look very closely, are partially open in an attempt to admit fresh air into the hidden interior. The billowing cloud of smoke undulating out of the dome's oculus, therefore, appears much more threatening than the small plume in the Birch's engraving, and in fact may be responsible for what, what I see as a sort of haze permeating uh, the space beneath the Lombardi poplars. The center square, steam engines ran on a mixture of wood and bituminous coal, and the watering committee worried that its huge consumption of fuel could negatively affect prices for Philadelphia citizens, who were already contending with the escalating cost of heating homes and businesses due to rapid depletion of easily accessible firewood. Sometime after 1806, the watering committee attempted to power the steam engine with anthracite coal mined in the Lehigh Valley, but found that it only served to put the fire out, and the remainder was broken up and spread on the walks like gravel. It was not until the 1820s that entrepreneurs discovered how to efficiently burn anthracite coal with limited oxygen and high heat. The center square engine house in Crimmel's painting, churning out a ribbon of dark smoke and surrounded by paths graveled with unburnt anthracite coal, therefore became a very visible symbol of inefficiency and in fuel waste to local citizens. In an 1816 letter to Polson's American Daily Advertiser, an anonymous author, author with, a civic, uh, with, a moniker, excuse me, with the moniker Civis called for the demolition of the engine house, which he described as vomiting, quote, torrents of smoke and soot, end quote, contributing to, quote, its gloomy condition within a polluted field, end quote. Such visual and textual descriptions mark the engine house as an unhealthy, contaminated body with internal corruption seeping out through its stained marble walls. Even William Rush's 1809 fountain sculpture, presiding over the crowd in Crimmel's painting, became beleaguered by its persistent associations with corruption and immorality. Carved out of pine and painted white to resemble marble, this allegorical figure, titled Water Nymph and Bittern, stood in classical contrapposto and carried a bittern, a lar large marsh bird, on her shoulder. And you'll, you can see the head of the sculpture, um, which is the only part of the sculpture to still survive in the gallery upstairs. As, as, as you can imagine, a wooden fountain sculpture doesn't last very long with water kind of streaming down over it. Another, another instance of a rotting body, I guess, within, the, within Center Square. And to give you some context, this is the bronze copy uh, that's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. 
So Rush, William Rush, the sculptor, served as an active member of the watering committee, actually, and he made key symbolic choices to visually reference the source of the city's water supply in his water nymph sculpture. The water bubbling from the artfully arranged rocks at the base and issuing to a height of 17 feet from the upraised beak of the bird visually connected the statue to the hidden processes of the waterworks behind it, representing both the water source at the Schuylkill and its subsequent dispersal, albeit in an aestheticized and allegorical way. The multiple and varied reactions to water nymph and bittern depicted in Crimmel's painting and recorded in the popular press speak to the public fascination and anxiety regarding the structure she embodies. The men to the left that you can see over here uh, appear enamored with the sculpture. One gestures wildly with his cane as he remarks on the figure to his neighbor. And the elegant dressed women on the right, um, which we've talked about kind of might represent the three graces, for example, they appear to mirror aspects of the water nymph's pose and dress. This Quaker gentleman in the center here um, is leading his wife and son away from the offending nymph. He sh he's shaking a finger at his son, who appears eager to climb over the fountain fence with the other young boys um, behind him. While his wife, I like his wife, is sort of like looking over her shoulder back at the figure. While several local newspapers praised Water Nymph and Bittern, an 1809 letter to the Tickler described an encounter with a group of tittering females observing the nude center square fount fountain statue, and she's not, I guess, not technically nude, still has this wet drapery effect. One grave matron exclaimed, why is so modest and represent immodest a representation exhibited to public view and under a government like ours where virtue ought to be the basis of our public institutions, end quote. Russ's, Russ's bittern was occasionally described in the local press as struggling to flee from the nymph's grasp, <laughs> hinting at the difficulties of the engine that the engine house experienced in harnessing, regulating, and containing the Schuylkill's resources. The varied reactions to Russ's allegorical figure in the press and in Krimmel's painting together speak to the growing concern regarding faulty technology, environmental pollution, and the failure of art and architecture to mask these modern realities behind a classical facade. Indeed, when Crimmel displayed his view of Center Square at the Pennsylvania Academy in 1812, Frederick Graff and John Davis, two former Latrobe assistants, had already submitted a proposal for a more secure and economical engine house to be built at Fairmount on the banks of the Schuylkill River, where you can see, still see that structure today. Initially conceived to improve the health of Philadelphia's citizens by establishing an underground circulatory system to flood the city with wholesome water, the design of the Center Square Engine House embodied Latrobe's knowledge of classical architecture, the natural world, and the interconnectedness of hydrological systems. The Center Square Waterworks ultimately failed, however, because of its own internal malfunctions, inefficiency, and contribution to the environmental pollution it was intended to mitigate. Understanding the context of this site reframes Kimmerell's painting as a thinly veiled commentary on urban environmental conditions, rather than a mere record of a convivial social gathering. And I'm going to conclude today with just uh, a little bit of a talk about my own exhibition that just opened this weekend at uh, the Mishner, so forgive this shameless promotion. But I found that once you open the door to eco-criticism, it's difficult to close it again. And, and I, I, it's hard for me to put away this lens that I've applied um, to works before as part of my own dissertation research. Um, so in my new post as curator of American art at the Michener, I've been turning this eco-critical lens to Pennsylvania Impressionism, which comprises the core of our collection, if you know the Michener at all, and our current exhibition, Impressionism to Modernism, the Lundfest Collection of American Art. So much like early Philadelphia landscape painters, the Pennsylvania Impressionists were drawn to streams and rivers, and especially the Delaware River in the early 20th century. Artists like Charles Rosen on the left and Edward Redfield on the right chose to display this major waterway as an idyllic site of natural beauty, framed by snow-covered hills or trees with shimmering foliage. The Delaware River, however, had been an important site of commerce and industry for more than a century prior to the completion of these paintings. And indeed, industry in proximity to waterways transformed the region's topography and ultimately spurred the establishment of New Hope as an important artist colony. It hasn't taken me long to realize that everything in Bucks County seems to happen in a mill. I'm not, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Bucks County Playhouse, a mill. Phillips Mill, which we'll talk about in just a minute. You know, previously a mill, of course. Uh, milling was the dominant industry in the region in the 18th and early 19th century. Bucks County Mills, many located on natural streams and waterways, produced timber, flour, textiles, and paper, among other goods. 
But by the early 20th century, however, when painters began moving into the region, most of these mills were abandoned. And artists took advantage of these vacant industrial spaces and established studios, homes, and even exhibition venues, which Phillips Mill on the left um, being perhaps the most famous. Uh, so it's here that William Lathrop, the la landscape painter, is really the one of the fathers of uh, Pennsylvania Impressionism. So he settled at Phillips Mill in 1899, hosting popular Sunday afternoon teas for the growest artist community, which included Morgan Colt, who painted this uh, uh, a barn here at Phillips Mill on the left. And it's actually Phillips Mill still operates as an exhibition venue today. These past industrial sites also became char charming features of the landscape, populating works by John Follinsby, Walter Baum, and others. So how did these artists grapple with the changing industrial landscape of Bucks County? Did they take note of environmental transformation in the region? I have to say these are questions that I still have to do more research yet to answer, but I hope will provide a new framework for understanding this beloved group of painters. Thank you. That was a. Uh, that's a very. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, this because I, I've always thought that the Pennsylvania Impressionists were so wonderful. Redfield especially, just wonderful painter. And uh, I'll be interested to hear more about that. So that's that's exciting. Um, Anna asked me to to uh, think about talking to you about what what what's happened in the time period that uh, I've been interested in Frederick Church. Which upon asking me that, I realized had been a longer time than I thought about. Um, <laughs> Almost now, uh, what's that, uh, 45 years, almost. Um, and uh, I thought I would outline for you, so this is going to be somewhat of a, of a personal uh, account, um, but it's also one I'm, I hope is, is pertinent and, and particularly references the great picture that, that uh, is here now in Pennsylvania, the Valley of the Santa Isabel, that some of us were uh, looking at just, just a little while ago on the, on the tour. Um, there's Frederick Church. Um, this was fairly late in life, about 1890, on one of his trips to Mexico. Um, he was by then uh, no longer painting a great deal. He suffered from uh, rheumatoid arthritis and had difficulty um, painting, and in fact was, was often in winters um, uh, escaping his home, uh, Olana, on the Hudson, uh, near, near the town of Hudson, to Mexico and other southern venues. Um, the painting on the left by Frederick Church is called In the Tropics, 1856. Um, it, was, it is a picture that was at the time I first had started in the museum work in uh, 1975 in the, in the Virginia Museum in Richmond. Uh, it was a painting that I was asked to give some thought to about an exhibition uh, that they were planning, a small exhibition about landscape painting, American landscape painting. And I knew absolutely nothing whatsoever about, A, American landscape painting, um, and B, Frederick Church. Um, so I went to the library in the museum. Um, this, of course, is long before internet, and um, uh, found that there were two small books on Frederick Church on the shelf. That was it. One was an exhibition catalog at the top there uh, of an exhibition held in 1966 in Washington at the then called National Collection of Fine Arts. Um, and uh, elsewhere, that was about... Um, 70 pages, and then a book by a man named David C. Huntington of about 200 pages that was a monographic study of the life and art of, of church. And um, this was not a, a, an unusual occurrence. I, I was to learn in uh, looking at the bibliography on American art in general and uh, 19th century landscape painting in particular. Uh, when I was a graduate student in subsequent years um, and began to specialize in this field, uh, I realized I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to be studying um, with uh, people who were part of the first generation in, in the post-Second uh, World War era who were really bringing American art scholarship not just to a new level, they were really pioneering in many cases. Uh, American art had been um, somewhat, uh, I, I think not somewhat, had been deeply undervalued by many art historians. And um, it was particularly with the American Bicentennial in 1876 um, that was the reason actually I was asked to work on this little exhibition of American landscape painting um, in 1975 was in preparation for the bicentennial. Um, 
I was able to study with many of the people who were the first really important generation of scholars, people like David Huntington, Wayne Craven, um, uh, Bill Gertz, William Homer, John Wilmerding. Um, and it, I found that, that in many cases, the bibliography um, on artists, major figures, uh, was really limited to often two or three books. Um, the oops, situation has, this is a very, there. This is just a small sample of what the state of, of, of play today would be. Um, there are many books now, a whole shelf full uh, on Frederick Church that include exhibition catalogs, um, some of which I'm guilty of, um, that have taken parts of Church's career, early landscapes, or his views of Cotopaxi, or single paintings, the great icebergs um, painting that, that was one of the sensational rediscoveries in, in uh, uh, the 1970s of a long lost uh, church painting, um, oil sketches, um, a book I wrote based on my doctoral dissertation, which was just about churches North American landscapes, a complete catalog of all of the works by church in two volumes at, that still remain at his home, Alana, uh, and very recently a wonderful book about church and the art and science of detail. Um, so, and these are just some of, of, of a much larger group of, of, of uh, books, and there are articles and exhibition catalogs, uh, and in some cases, uh, online publications that, that exist in, in, in that sphere alone. So we now have a much wider and, I think, deeper f field to look at uh, Frederick Church, um, but that was not the case in 1975. Uh, and when I went to uh, that uh, shelf in the library and found the, the two books, uh, and read them very quickly, um, someone pointed out to me that if I wanted to read a really good book about American 19th century painting, I needed to go to find this book by Barbara Novak, a contemporary of, of uh, the people I was just mentioning a moment ago, uh, called American Painting of the 19th Century, Realism, Idealism, and the American Experience. And I was told that this was a book that really posited and argued successfully that American art could be studied with the same level of uh, seriousness and scholarship uh, that, say, 19th century French or British uh, landscape painting um, had, had enjoyed, and that this was an, an indication of, of the beginning of a, of a coming in age, of age of the field. So I did indeed go to that book and found that it had a series of chapters. Uh, it was mainly organized of chapters about individual 19th century American artists. Uh, it started with a kind of introduction uh, on Copley, uh, but really it was about Cole and Durand and Heed and Lane, and it moved on into the later 19th century, but there was no chapter on church. Uh, he was curiously missing from the book other than that painting, The Heart of the Andes, um, which was uh, mentioned as an example of what Novak considered a kind of a uh, different strain of American art than what she was interested in, one that was more theatrical, more grandiose. She actually came to use the term grand opera uh, uh, versus what she called the still small uh, voice uh, um, of, say, a painter like Fitzhenry Lane, who was, was on the cover of her book. Uh, and I was struck by this sort of absence um, of, of scholarship on, on church. And, and I was then curious to see if there was anything else I could read about church. I'm sorry, I, uh, let me back up for a minute. I went on then to, to, to look at church from a particular lens, which said that it was the artist who got up to Heart of the Andes, who was principally of interest, uh, and that so much after that period in his art was different, or some not, if not, not less interesting, somehow very different and not as pertinent. And I devoted my own interest then to his works from his early career, 1845, that work on the left, you can see what a precocious talent he was. He was 19 years old when he painted that. He was born in 1826, uh, near photographic realism, literally. Um, he continued with um, paintings that began to make his name in the later 1840s, like the Great West Rock New Haven. Or, uh, as I mentioned on the tour earlier, uh, his first paintings of South American landscapes. This is one of the four he showed in 1854, uh, in 1855 in New York, that were sensations. And this 
led me on to, to a kind of view of, of, of church that was very much based on this notion of church as a scientific artist, as an artist of, of precise detail, of clear, revealing, describing light. Everything very clearly revealed to you as a way of giving you information about the world. And absolutely the epitome of that was this six by 10 foot landscape called the Heart of the Andes uh, that he exhibited uh, both in New York and in, uh, abroad in, in Europe, as well as around, uh, traveled around this country as a single painting exhibition for paid admission, uh, an amazing experience that uh, people would spend hours, literally, looking at this painting. Pamphlets were written about it. Um, one pamphlet gave a detailed ex explanation of the painting purely in terms of science, in terms of what you could learn from the botany of the foreground to the geology of the, of the near and distant uh, mountains, uh, and that this was in that sense a very uh, a, a didactic scientific lesson. Another pamphlet written by a friend of churches who happened to be an Episcopalian minister was all about how this was a revelation of God's handiwork throughout the, the, uh, the, the various types of landscape that it portrayed. And indeed, it's meant to be read as if it is a series of, of kind of, uh, of visual episodes that start with the area here and carry through this. By the way, uh, this tree, you can't see it in the engraving upstairs, but this is where Church signed his name. Uh, he did it so illusionistically as not to interfere with the illusion of depth. It's actually illusionistically carved into the tree, F.E. Church, 1859. Then you move through space down here to a small wayside shrine with a cross and some figures, across the middle of it with this great waterfall in the distance. And then finally through this up to the, to the peak of the great uh, Andean volcano Chimborazo, uh, which was so high that it was always clothed in um, um, snow. Uh, in fact, that was another um, sort of reference of this great landscape was that it showed you uh, what were considered different zones of climate from a tropical lowland forest jungle all the way through a kind of temperate zone up to a frozen, ever, ever frozen kind of Arctic zone. Uh, this was something that Alexander von Humboldt, the great German naturalist, had, had posited as ways of understanding the different parts of the world, uh, and that church was deeply influenced by Humboldt, uh, and in fact, uh, this was his greatest homage to um, Alexander Humboldt's um, um, theories about the world, much of which uh, Humboldt had worked out in South America. Um, those different parts of the landscape can be, as I said, traversed uh, visually and mentally as a kind of series, again, of visual episodes. In fact, one of those pamphlets I mentioned divided it up into 10 chapters. Um, this is extraordinarily, uh, again, a, a, a painting about a kind of learning experience as well as a visually uh, beautiful and aesthetically satisfying experience. Uh, but in my, my looking around for bibliography on church, I found one more publication back in 1975 uh, that I could look at, which was a journal, the Brooklyn Museum's annual, uh, with an article by that same person, David Huntington, um, um, who had written the, the book I showed you previously, and it was called Landscape and Diaries, the South American Trips of F.E. Church. It was occasioned, it was an article commissioned um, from David Huntington, um, the only person that they could find who was interested in church at that time, uh, because the, Brit the um, Brooklyn Museum had acquired this painting called South American Atlantic, 1873, and they wanted someone to write about that. And in so doing, Huntington wrote very extensively, uh, quoting from Church's diaries of his South American travels, which were very instructive, very, very um, 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 useful in, in tracing the, the, the sort of chronology of what Church saw and where he went. But when he got to talking about the specific painting, Huntington seemed to realize uh, immediately that there was something different about it than what most people would associate with Church the heart of the Andes, for instance, as his epitome of South American scenery. Uh, and the painting that Huntington related South American landscape to was the one that's now here, the Valley of the Santa Isabella. And these paintings looked to me, even in the black and white illustrations in this uh, journal, they looked to me as so fundamentally different uh, than what I knew about church that I thought, well, that's, quite frankly, 
I didn't think they were that interesting to what I wanted to do, and I, I, I didn't think much more about them. And in fact, what struck me, again, was how different something like the Valley of the Santa Isabel was from the Heart of the Andes. Church had not been back. When he painted Heart of the Andes, he had just come back from the tropics under two years earlier, armed with sketches and visual memory, which he was said to have uh, one that it, what was beyond, simply beyond comprehension, what he could remember visually. But now, you know, 15, 16, 17 years later, he's gone back to this subject. He's done other things in between icebergs, the old world. He's traveled in Syria and Jordan and, and painted landscapes of that. Um, but he's now after something, I think, fundamentally different. And I think the key to that had to do with light. These are paintings from after the period of the heart of the Andes, the afterglow, a Jamaican scene, another tropical landscape, but now clearly about as much about light as it is about, about the, the landscape or a view of uh, a composite view of Syria, the, the, the various ages of, of civilization in Syria from the Roman, uh, the Byzantine, I mean, just a kind of catalog of, of ancient civilizations, um, the Valley of the Santa Isabel, again, with light and atmosphere, very so descriptively. And then this painting, very large now, eight foot wide painting um, called, uh, at, when I first started working on this particular painting at the National Gallery, when I went there in 1980, was called Morning in the Tropics. And I was able to uh, learn that, in fact, its original title was The River of Light. It was actually given in Spanish, El Rio de Luz, um, originally. Morning in the Tropics was a later name. And I was struck by that. I was struck by the difference of this painting from Heart of the Andes, for instance, with its much more immediate, much more close up view of the tropical landscape, a completely different scale. If the distant peak of Chimborazo in Heart of the Andes was said to be 60 miles away in that painting, this is clearly a much smaller part of the world. Uh, it also has in the distance just disappearing into the mist, a man in a boat. Um, that reminded me of something that Church's teacher had painted, Thomas Cole, of course, the great voyage of life. You have the four great engravings after that series uh, in the exhibition upstairs. And it posited very, very obviously the notion of, the, of life from infancy to youth to manhood to old age as a, as a voyage on a river. And the final part of that voyage is the end of, of life and the transition along a kind of celestially lit pathway into another world. I was struck. Now, it didn't hurt that at the National Gallery of Art, I could look at the church painting and then literally walk about 15 feet to see the Voyage of Life in the next gallery. But I was struck by the coincidence of this parallel of a boat traveling along a river and the title, The River of Light, as if it's a transition between earthly and heavenly spheres, as how much that was like, the voyage of life. And it made me think now in terms of church becoming much more retrospective about not just his own life, he's thinking back to his career as a painter of the tropics in, in uh, one of his most famous types of subject. He's thinking back to his master, Thomas Cole, but he's also in creating a kind of landscape uh, and when I went back to David Huntington's 1963 article, he used the phrase a psychic landscape about these late things, that you're meant to be involved personally, not involved the same way that you were with, say, Heart of the Andes, um, but as a series of, of revelations, but more as a series of self-examinations or thinking more about your individual place in the world. And I came to understand that it made sense now that this painting shouldn't be seen as, in terms of difference from Heart of the Andes, it should be seen as absolutely part of the train of, of aesthetic, aesthetic and, and intellectual process that Church had gone on later in his career. So much had changed from the time of the Heart of the Andes. That was pre-Civil War. It was a period of, of a different uh, moment in the American landscape school in terms of what was popular. Church himself went from the height of fame to 
somewhat neglect in his later years uh, until the time he died in 1900. Many people said they had no idea who he even had been. Um, so as I said, this would be a slightly personal view. If I can say anything about how the landscape of looking at Frederick Church has changed over the last, say, 45 years, it's been that there is now a much richer, a more far uh, uh, instructive bibliography in terms of other people's work and what they've done in looking at him, uh, but also for, for myself personally, and, and I, I know for others, including Anna, who so brilliantly acquired the Valley of the Santa Ana's Valley for uh, the Academy, that there we now have a much greater, I think, understanding of that he was a different and in some ways equally rich artist of the period of after the great works that we so well knew from before. So thank you. Um, so thank you. Those two talks were just amazing. Um, I hope everybody agrees. I, I feel like I got a sort of master class in American landscape scholarship <laughs> from Barbara Novak to, you know, Nature's Nation. Um, so I, I want to make sure that people in the audience have a chance to ask a question. Um, but I'm really struck by one of the themes that emerged out of this day, which is kind of reevaluating and relooking and rethinking. Uh, you know, I think the Schuylkill to Hudson project takes a shift uh, from looking at the Hudson River School to the Schuylkill School and thinking, rethinking about American landscape that way. Um, you know, uh, Frank was talking about how he looks at church differently now than he did 45 years ago, and indeed how church looks at the landscape of South America differently. Uh, one of the things that I was talking to Frank about was that um, in doing my research on that painting, I discovered that there was a devastating earthquake in the Valley of Santa Isabella in 1875 um, in Colombia. And what might Church have felt when he looked back at that after reading those devastating newspaper reports and creating that painting? I love the idea of the the that boat uh, figure. That's amazing. I'm gonna I'm gonna use that. Um, and then Laura, you know, I I I have said to her like how excited I am that she's gonna take on Pennsylvania Impressionism because when I did my artist garden show, I made sure to stop it at 18, uh, 1920 because I didn't wanna deal with Pennsylvania Impressionism. Because <laughs> um, it, you know, it was already enough for me to take on American Impressionism. Um, but as soon as you started showing those mills, I was like, oh yes, this is exciting. This is gonna be great. <laughs> Um, so I wonder, maybe I'll start with you, Laura, like what, what do you think about um, th these new approaches to landscape and, and, and how we're going to move things forward in a very iconic American art field? Right. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to take on the Pennsylvania Impressionists, and I hope you all come to the Michener and, and see the show as well. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, the, I have different ideas about, you know, what new work needs to be done on Pennsylvania Impressionism. As I mentioned, I'm interested in this environmental perception. I mean, these artists were very deeply you know, engaged with the local Bucks County environment. You know, Redfield was known for taking his canvas out into the snow and all sorts of weather and painting. Um, and it's, I think it's interesting what they choose to depict and what they choose not to depict in their, in their paintings. And it kind of changes, I think, as they go on into the 20th century. You start to see Walter Baum, for example. I showed a Baum, a painting of an abandoned mill, but he starts to paint more industrial scenes as well going forward. So, I, you know, they start to, they, they're taking note of these changes in the landscape. But I, I do find it fascinating that I really think there wouldn't be a colony at New Hope if there wasn't this um, such a, a, a so many mills in that area. <laughs> like they just so many artists lived in a mill. <laughs> 
Um, and it's, I mean, they're like perfect spaces to set up a studio and they were, you know, they, I think artists were really drawn to these um, industrial spaces. But I'm, I'm also interested too in uh, showcasing more of the female Impressionist, uh, Pennsylvania Impressionist painters too. I think that's, there's more work that needs to be done there. Um, and also to connect them more internationally. I think they're, they're very frequently um, interpreted through this, you know, very local lens. But these, these are well-traveled artists that, you know, they studied at PAFA, they went to the National Academy of Design, they studied abroad, you know, they, they've, they, they painted in, you know, all, all up and down the New England coast. So they're not, not quite as regional as I think we want them to be sometimes. And Frank, um, I wanted to ask you, what do you, the learning a little bit about, um, you know, the, the work that Laura's interested in, in terms of eco-critic criticism um, and then also we sort of you when we gave the tour you briefly raised the specter of empire um, but thinking about industry and empire and economy how would you look at the the South American landscapes of church um, from that uh, perspective which might be different from the way you would have looked at it 45 years ago um. I would I would certainly look at it differently in part because a lot of the work that that occurred in um, the the 1980s and early 90s about landscape American landscape in particular focused much more on um, patronage and um, the the particular interests commercial political social interests of who it was the paintings uh, were painted for in essence uh, the very strongly northeastern bias of that, especially New York, um, where, where the center of the art market uh, had, had, had basically become so well established, certainly by the, the 1830s and 40s, um, and that how we can't look at these landscapes sort of innocently of, mm -hmm. or innocent of that. Um, and I think that that then would obviously, um, I mean, I have to say it wasn't, it wasn't difficult to imagine a kind of imperialist urge when you see people going off to South America, um, given what was going on, uh, the, you know, the Mexican-American War in you know, the late 40s, you know, annexed half of the southwest part of this country. Um, so, uh, but there's something that I learned, I was very fortunate to learn early on in my career because I, as I mentioned, I came along in a particular moment where there were there was a lot of extraordinarily important work had been done, monographic work and, and sorting out artists' um, careers. Uh, but it was not uncommon then to be told as a student if you suggested you might want to work on an individual artist, uh, it was not uncommon to be told um, he's, he's done. They were almost universally he's, I'm sorry. Um, he's been done. I heard that a number of times. Um, and I heard it specifically about Frederick Church. Um, and it's one reason I, I, I became interested in his North American pictures in particular, because they had maybe been less done. Um, <laughs> but I screwed up my courage when I decided I wanted to, to write on Frederick Church seriously, do my doctoral dissertation. And I went to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where David Huntington was teaching. And I went into his office and introduced myself and had a wonderful time talking to him. And he made it clear that from his point of view, nobody was ever done. And he welcomed the idea that one might have different ideas and new ideas. Um, and I, I not only appreciated that, I mean, it, it, it sounds like he was giving me permission, which I suppose in a way he was, but, but he, was, he was helping me learn something. And I, I've never forgotten it, and I hope I've always tried to convey this when I'm in my own teaching, is that it's never done. And in fact, once a painting, as I like to say, as a, let's just say a landscape painting, an artist sort of releases it into the public and into the future, where if it survives, it's going to have a life far beyond what can be, you know, imagined, predicted. That it's always going to have a new a, a new way of looking, and that's about about us. It's about you know those who came before us and those who will come after it. And uh, how wonderful that is! I mean, it means it's always going to be interesting. Um, so I've, I've, I've had my own work reacted to in, in ways that sometimes have been flattering and sometimes not. But, you know, I, I'm delighted that, you know, that that goes on. And uh, uh, it's, I think it speaks to the richness of the field now in American art in particular. 
Well, I think that's a great uh, way to just open it up. Uh, we don't, we, I think we're at three o'clock, but uh, if there are any questions, especially from the students in the audience, um, I would welcome that. But I saw you, sir, had a question. We're all still students, right? <laughs> some relevancy to help us to understand this. So looking at you know, an eco-critical approach, looking at you know never being done to understand something. I'm wondering if you each could maybe offer a few more comments on what you think the history of art has to offer for our understanding. And I don't mean like you know a direct historical correlation that ever happens like that, mm -hmm. but deeper themes, deeper understandings, and not you know the politics of the day so much as sort of the deeper human experience of what we're going to need to draw on to be able to move forward in some kind of hopeful re uh, resolution of what's going on. What does the field of art history, in your perspectives, do you think has to offer maybe today? And that's a big yeah. what a What a nice, light question. No, I was, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, but I think it's, but I, but I you do. I, I, oh, sure, sure. Let me, no problem. No, but I. <laughs> I, I, I hope you don't mind, I'll just yeah. uh, jump in, but because it's something that I've thought a lot about, you know, in, in the work that I do. Um, and of course, you know, my approach to historical art is informed by our current, e you know, ecological crisis. Um, and it's something that I think about a lot and it informs my scholarship. Uh, I do think, um, well, this is, this I think applies to what I studied in the past and I think how artists are producing works today. I think my, this upcoming show I'm working on at the Michener in the spring um, about contemporary art and environment I think is a good example of that. But I think artists make, um, you know, they, they make, they, they, we look at things differently because of art. And I think especially um, when it comes to issues like climate change, things that are, I think, difficult for people to comprehend. It's hard, it's such a massive thing. Um, it's it's hard it's hard for us to visualize and, and confront it, um, and I think art that's really where art steps in in a lot of ways and, and makes these issues more tangible and more concrete, um, and it, at times provides you know hopeful ideas for the future, and I think in the periods that I've studied in the past you know the early early 19th century Philadelphia artists were struggling with these issues as well like what do we do about deforestation and water and air pollution. And I think they came up with some pretty creative solutions. I mean, Latrobe's waterworks unfortunately failed, but he was still, <laughs> but he was thinking, you know, he was thinking about the way that, you know, water would circulate through a city. This, the Philadelphia waterworks were really the earliest waterworks system in, in the United States. And um, the, you know, the next waterwork system, which was more successful, really drew upon the lessons that were learned in Latrobe's waterworks, for example. And I spoke a little bit upstairs during our gallery talk, you know, Charles Wilson Peel, for example, who we know is this portrait painter and museum curator, was designing fuel-efficient fireplaces and stoves. Um, you know, William, William Rush, the sculptor who made that fountain sculptor, he was involved in the watering committee. He was um, writing about how, he was, he was worried later on in his life about development and pollution along the Schuylkill River. So, you know, the artists, artists have a, a very unique voice, I think, and I, I, they're, I, they're instrumental, I think, in alerting us to contemporary concerns. Even if you're looking at historical art as well, I think we see a lot of resonances there. Um, I'm going to be a bit, bit, bit more sort of general, I suppose, but uh, and it's a, it's a question that when you ask it, I hear the question that's so often asked about people who are involved in teaching liberal arts in the university context and where enrollments are, are falling and, you know, whatever. And one of the things that I feel in, in inevitably sort of hopeful about is that, it, it, that you can learn about looking, and that's not just looking visually, it's looking mentally and asking questions and I don't mean questioning irreverently, you know, necessarily, but but received information is that just that, and uh, it's a it's a way of of I think art historically, at least the art history that I always loved, and it's to ask questions and to to to, to try to understand. First of all, what do you think you see? What do you think you understand? And how might that be, you know, understood differently? Um, and I've hoped that at some point in my own teaching career, I might team teach with people from um, science and from, you know, and uh, and even help try to, we, for instance, the National Gallery have offered 
um, courses in looking to medical students because how important it is not to make a diagnosis based on maybe something that you know very, very well, but you see what you know. Um, and this will probably sound maybe too idealistic, but I think if we can help people think that way more questioningly, more openly, and more uh, sort of uh, aware of what you see and what you, you know, what it is you think and how you think it and how you can be open to that, 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 that at least would give me, I think, some hope. Yes. I've always been kind of intrigued that right at this time was the Centennial Exposition. And all around the world, there's been a focus on new machinery, new, at least what's come down to us was the mechanics of new invention or so. And I'm not a scholar, but it was also part of that This is exactly where the Philadelphia School still goes to because it's in New England, but this enrichment that it what was there a help it? Well the, the you know the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition is just a wonderful moment where there's both the new, you know, the centerpiece was the great Corliss steam engine and technology and the possibilities of that, but there were also historical exhibits. There was a, if I know, if I remember correctly, there was a recreation of a colonial, you know. Yeah, it was so the that beginning it, of the colonial revival. The colonial revival, so mm -hmm. that we're, 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 we were sort of being given history, a hundred years as a sort of legitimacy of a historical framework for the American uh, nation, but then also poss the future, the possibility, and the, and I think that combination of the of the forward and the retrospective um, was was central in in much of what the celebration of the centennial um, um, stressed. And uh, uh, I think you're probably right. A lot of what we're dancing around here is is very much in that that vein. Mm -hmm. Richard, you had a question. That's not a big question, Richard. <laughs> so he's, uh, Richard is referencing a really famous painting, Twilight in the Wilderness, that was painted during the Civil War by Church. Um, where, where is that painting? In Cleveland. Cleveland. I actually, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but that's what I wrote the entire book I wrote called Frederick Church in the National Landscape was to try to explain that one painting. <laughs> Um, so go buy the book. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean I'm, that's the honest truth. <laughs> um, another Richard. Yeah. Uh, I was just interested uh, how our historians today are interpreting the word landscape. We saw, uh, two, we saw kind of an urban state with poplar trees in the background. We saw Andes with classical landscape. But recently I was reading a, a, a Where the, the the author, young author, was using an older Germanic Dutch tradition of Landschaft, in which the, it means not just the state, the, 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 the environment, but also means polity and thus community. Hmm. And so the extent to which, but when we looked at those two images up there, are we really just looking at the landscape, or are we looking at a commentary on the, uh, uh, the, the wider nation that's, being, hmm. that's in, in, in the process of change? And I would imagine that's what. That's one of the things that has changed with our historical scholarship. These these images have been enriched, deepened, and kind of looking for more clues in what the artist is trying to represent. Mm -hmm. Or am I going totally haywire? No, I absolutely don't. not. No, no, no. no. I true. Would yes, agree with you. And yeah. I think, particularly in the Schuylkill to Hudson show, you know the the painting of the Schuylkill by Thomas Birch definitely has that. And that landscape, that civically engineered space, 
you know, which gets translated into a print and then gets hand painted on a Chinese export ware teacup, mm -hmm. you know, comes to represent the United States. And, and I think that in the history of landscape painting that that is something that goes on and on mm -hmm. in, in the country. Right. And I was being a little silly in the beginning of my talk by saying it's not a landscape because it, I mean, it still sort of is, but, um, and I don't, I don't have the answer to what is a, a landscape because it's, it is, I, um, it's, it's something that I, I know a lot of scholars have agonized over, but I, but I do know, I can say that, um, in, you know, in this, this eco-critical field, there's, there's a lot of, uh, anxiety about the term landscape because it is, it, I think it has this passive, um, associations with it as like, it's something that we kind of admire and, and, and just sort of take in as opposed to something like more ecological that's like interrelated and, and dynamic. Um, so, so there is, I think some pushback against the landscape term. I still use it, um, in my own work. I'd be curious to hear what Frank has to think about, has to say about that term. Um, I, I, I understand that, and I, I, but I can't say that I've been doing any work recently that, that <laughs> involves landscape. But, um, but uh, I, no, I think absolutely, it's it's a these sorts of questions are constant, and and your comment about community, and you know, I think one of the things that's that's much more evident now is how many communities there are mm -hmm. that are, are sometimes addressed by these works, often ignored, yeah. sometimes not even dreamed of. I mean, so that that there are sort of it's, it's like someone used to say, you put one thing in the middle, you got one thing on the right, you got one thing on the left, you got something in front, you got something behind, you got something up, you got something down, forget it, you got everything. So it's, you know, it's, it's all over the place. Um, okay, we have lots more questions. Uh, we'll, we'll take maybe two more. Do you go ahead. That's probably better for Laura, but I, mean, I was there has say it's been... better for you because I was thinking about churches touring landscapes and how they. I mean, there's it's been... really the spectacular aspect of them that drew the crowds. Like, yeah. I think more than more than anything. But, I mean, but... Cole did rail against yeah. what was happening literally right. in his yeah. backyard in mm -hmm. Catskill, where they cut down the trees and put in a little railroad. It's long gone. So um, yeah, yeah, the 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 notion that it was it was not just in danger of being lost that it was being lost. I mean, that was what Barbara Novak famously called the, you know, the double-edged axe, the axe, the symbol of progress, of clearing and, you know, and destruction at the same time. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think that was certainly part of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that too. Um, over the, y yes. Uh, that's a great question. I'll take that one. You should. Um, <laughs> and I just justify it. I, I was talking to one of our visitor services people, person, people, and they said, you know, th they were really upset. They're like, somebody came through and they were saying, you know, like that all this stuff didn't really come from Philadelphia. It came from Europe. And I'm like, oh yeah, they're right. <laughs> and, and she, and they were like, but I thought you were saying it's all started in Philadelphia. And I'm like, well, no, I mean, you know, if we want to get into the history of landscape, it really comes back from landscape and we might trace it from Dutch traditions or we might trace it from Italian traditions of, you know, uh, or Roman and Palladianism. It has a huge long history. And I think all I'm interested in as a scholar is, is, debunking myths and um, opening up alternative viewpoints. Um, and one of the reasons I, the first label in the show um, is called Before the Schuylkill and the Hudson is uh, because it acknowledges that the Schuylkill and the Hudson are European names and we are all on Lenape lands on the Schuylkill, the Delaware and the Hudson. So 
I could see a very different exhibition, um, which is very aware of Native American cosmologies and approaches to the landscape happening and upending everything that all three of us have done. Um, and I think what one of the things that what I heard Frank talking about that I think is makes him a great teacher and mentor is he's open to all of that. And I would think that we all are open to opening up ideas and then having somebody else tear them down. But I don't think it behooves us to not open up those new ideas. So I'm not trying to say, I mean, I joke sometimes and I say everything started in Philadelphia, but you know, when I get a job in Boston or when I get a job in Ottawa, I'll say it all started there because I'll have a new angle, right? And I just want us to explore all the angles. So I think we got to get out of here. Uh, oh. I just have an, kind of an announcement. Yeah, yes. My name's Edgar Chester. I was hired by the Philadelphia Water Department to put together a museum. That's a Paramount Water. Mm. And we are doing Oh, thank you. I mean, thank you. Because we understood mm -hmm. okay, from an early time mm -hmm. uh, what we were doing, the possibility of pollution mm -hmm. this river. Yeah. And so we, this is one place you all can go free, uh, the Fairmount Waterworks, mm -hmm. and uh, we are STEAM, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. science, technology, uh, engineering, art, and architecture. And and our most recent exhibit is on the mighty muscle, <laughs> freshwater muscle, which, well, let me tell you, we, we got a, a, a nice grant from, uh, from the William Penn Foundation, mm -hmm. and we put together a hatchery, a muscle hatchery at the Waterworks. Okay. And as a result, we did it with uh, the Academy of Natural Sciences and with the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. The partnership for the Delaware Estuary has, um, <clears throat> has received a $7.5 million grant to build a commercial hatchery mm -hmm. to put mussels back in the river to clean the river. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, yeah. so we, uh, this is a place where I welcome you. It's free. It's an amazing museum, and actually, we worked with the museum um, and the education department at the museum to work on this show, and they are one of our co-sponsors. And if any of you got a Philadelphia de Water Department bill, you would have seen uh, a flyer for our show. Uh, and we love the Philadelphia Water Department and the museum at the Waterworks. So thank you all for coming today. Yes.